Cooper Talk Mysteries. I'm Julie Cooper, a mystery and thriller writer, and half of the duo bringing you our regular podcast series, spotlighting mystery, suspense, and thriller fiction. First, thanks again to my brother Chris Squires for our ominous theme song, The Man in the Panama Hat. And I'm going to keep our listeners in suspense for just another minute here. Here are a couple of the stellar reviews for the accomplished mystery writer who joins us today. Integrating a whodunit plotline with a realistic depiction of life on or near the battlefield. And that's a Publishers Weekly starred review. And for our listeners, that's a big deal in the publishing world. Here's another one. His books have been called a lively and surprisingly thoughtful series. That's from the New York Times Review of Books. James Ben is our special guest today and author of Solemn Graves, the newest in his line of 13 mysteries. He's known for his outstanding mystery series set within the Allied High Command in Europe, featuring U.S. Army Lieutenant Billy Boyle during World War II. For those of you who think you wouldn't like a military mystery, you just haven't been reading the right ones. These mysteries emphasize character development instead of overwhelming the reader with military protocol, jargon, weapons, and technical details. His books are about the politics of power, duty, guilt, love, and the effects of war on both military and civilians, along with lots of action and suspense. Your fifth book, Jim, Rag and Bone, depicts the impact of war on the city of London, including the Blitz and families living in the tube stations during that dangerous time. I know that's a period of history that my colleague, Wendy, is especially fascinated by, as her mother was a plane spotter in the UK during World War II. Jim's book, A Blind Goddess, a favorite of mine, was shortlisted for the prestigious Dublin Literary Award and one of his other novels, The Rest is Silence, was a Barry Award finalist for Best Novels in 2015. In a past life, James was a librarian and worked in information technology for over 35 years, so you know he's done the research and gotten the facts right. Just relax, because the historical details are seamlessly woven into the plots. No footnotes required. James lives on the Florida Gulf Coast and also in Connecticut with his wife, Deborah Mandel, a psychotherapist. And he has two sons and seven lively grandchildren. Welcome, James Ben. It's such a pleasure to have you join us here today. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, Julie and Wendy, for having me uh, be part of your podcast. And I'm just uh, looking forward to this. Oh, I am too. It's it's funny that you mentioned um, Wendy's... uh, mother being a plane spotter. I just came back from a, um, a book event in North Carolina at a bookstore where people came with uh, remembrances from their relatives who had been in the war, uh, letters, postcards, um, all sorts of little artifacts that they oh, just wonderful. valued tremendously. And it's that connection that people have to that, that conflict, I think, that helps keep this series uh, of interest to people. Oh, wonderful. Well, we'll hope to hear more about that. And our theme for today is the gift of historical fiction. If it's well-researched and written with an eye toward authenticity, we can learn so much from the past, whether it's seeing a reckless reckless debutante from 1907 Los Angeles transform into a hard-working, mystery-solving sleuth, I'm thinking here of Jennifer Kinslow's The Secret Life of Anna Blanc, or learning about the brilliant opium-addled forensic scientist in Victorian London in David Morrell's Inspector of the Dead series, to Renee Patrick's wonderful vintage Hollywood mysteries set in the 1930s, mixing scandal, corruption, and Nazis. Who could resist that? And then there's James Ben's insightful Lieutenant Boyle, who's taught me things about World War II that I never knew. So I guess I'm trying to say to our listeners, don't write off historical fiction. The clothing, the morals, and the language may be very different, but the emotions and the motivations are much the same and well worth exploring as you're drawn into a really good story. And now I'm going to turn it over to Wendy because I know she has some burning questions for Jim. Thanks, Julie. Wendy Kendall here, cozy mystery writer. Jim, I'm so Jim, I'm so happy that your Billy Boyle 
World War II Mystery Series is continuing with your newest book, Solemn Graves. This time, U.S. Army Detective Billy Boyle is called to investigate a mysterious murder in a Normandy farmhouse that threatens Allied operations just a month after D-Day. The investigation is top secret to protect the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, also known as the Ghost Army. As your readers find out, this Ghost Army does kind of what a red herring does. Their activities are meant to cause the enemy to think they're facing larger formations than they really are. That changes the enemy's actions and decisions based on misleading information. How very like a mystery author. Can you talk a little about the fun of red herrings in mystery stories and the challenge of planting clues? Yep. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I'll just say first that I, when I stumbled upon uh, this unit, the Ghost Armory, which was just about a thousand men uh, tasked with uh, this deception campaign uh, using phony radio transmissions and inflatable tanks and um, all sorts of subterfuges, I thought this is really an interesting group of people because they were recruited from the arts. Uh, there were set designers and, and Broadway producers and actors and uh, artists of all sorts. Um, Bill Blass, the fashion designer, was a young 19-year-old private in this unit. Uh, so it was a real odd assemblage of characters and I thought it would be a ripe setting for all these red herrings, because as, as you mentioned, their, their job was deception. Um, but when it actually comes to uh, clues and planting red herrings, I, I have to say that's the one part of writing a mystery that I, I find the, the least interesting, because it's mostly about the, the whodunit. And I'm always much more interested in why somebody would commit a crime. And I mean, I do the red herrings and I put the clues in, but it's, it's, it's almost like someday I just want to write a book where they, it ends with, well, we don't know who did it, but uh, you know, that person deserves it. <laughs> uh, but it, you have to work at putting the clues in and I often use distraction. I, I often think of a magician that when they're you know, pulling the rabbit out of the hat, they're doing something with their other hand. So um, one trick that I, I've stumbled on is having that distraction that you present the clue, but at the same time that something tremendously interesting has just happened or surprising or shocking. Um, and that's a, a good uh, tricky way to introduce those red herrings. Thank you, that's really interesting. Your <laughs> historical setting. Great, great analogy, yeah. Your historical setting is incredible. This is an amazing time in history. But on top of that, you've written yet another well-done whodunit. In Solemn Graves, Billy Boyle is pitted against a truly cunning killer. Can you talk a little about creating this villain? Uh, sure. And uh, actually, <laughs> the funny thing is, after writing uh, the 12 previous books, you know, there's a real challenge in keeping a series fresh because people uh, really cleave to the characters. They come back because the, the, they're friends, you know, and they want to see how they're doing. But they also want a different book each time. So there's a bit of a balancing act there. How do you make the book different but still the same? Uh, and I came up with an idea for this book, and it was that I figured if Billy doesn't know who the killer is, it's a little unfair that I should know. So I, I, I present, it's a bit of a, not a locked room mystery, and there's no spoiler here, because you learn in the first, first few pages that they're sent to uh, investigate the murder of an officer at a battalion headquarters who had arrived in the middle of the night, was from another unit, he shouldn't have been there. He was found with his throat slit. Nobody had any idea what he was doing there, um, and it's, it's a security risk, so he's sent to investigate. And I decided I was not going to pick the killer, that I would take Billy to this 
farmhouse where they make Calvados, the apple brandy that Normandy is famous for. Um, it had been the headquarters of a German unit. Now it's the headquarters of an American unit. And I would populate it with soldiers, uh, civilians, the farmer, uh, French resistance people, and just let their personalities emerge and their conflicts emerge and see who had a reason to kill this poor officer. And my wife kept asking me as I was writing, do you know who did it yet? Do you know who did it? And finally, about a third of the way through, I remember shouting out, I, I know who the killer is. And <laughs> so I'll just say to readers, if you uh, figure out who the killer is before the first third, third of the book is done, you did a lot better than I did. So that's how I, I just let the motivations and emotions emerge that revealed who the killer would be. Nice. Thank you. Well, what are the advantages and the challenges of writing this series in Billy Boyle's first person point of view? Well, I almost didn't. I, I, I was so um, uh, worried about how to present Billy because he was actually born in a, my first book, uh, which was a uh, on Desperate Ground, it's a World War II thriller, very traditional. Um, and he was a secondary character. And I ended up renaming him because I thought he, he would be of interest to start a series with. And I didn't want him to be in a book at the end of the war. So I knew I wanted to use this character. That book had been written in the third person, multiple points of view. And I was just so intimidated by the first person. I said, I'm not going to do it. And I remember sitting at the computer, hands poised on the keyboard, and the first line of the first book typed itself, and it was, I wanted to die. And I just sat back, and what the hell happened? I said, okay, you know, Billy wants to tell his story. And his voice just emerged uh, out of that process. And um, there are challenges, obviously, because it's just such a narrow point of view. You're only looking through his eyes throughout the whole story. And it makes uh, his secondary characters, his cohorts, uh, Kaz and Big Mike, all that much more important because he can use them as sounding boards. They can go off and do things and come back and report on things that he doesn't have to go then do. So um, I think there's an immediacy to the character um, and it lets his voice emerge in a way that third person could never do. Um, but then you do have to have those little tricks to have um, get around uh, some plot points and some narrative direction so that you can move the story along. Well, James, your action scenes, I mean, especially, I love scenes, for example, like the World War II piloting in the first chapter of the Billy Boyle adventure titled The Devouring. That gripped mm -hmm. me from page one. These scenes you create are so vivid and exciting. What are important elements that you keep in mind as a writer in order to convey the essence of this action to readers like me who have never felt anything like it? Uh -huh. You know, there's there's been two influences that really have moved me in that direction. And one was a book I read in college, very famous book, Johnny Got His Gun by Dalton Trumbo. Uh, it's about a World War I soldier who is so horribly maimed, he has no limbs, no face, no mouth, no, no eyes to see. Um, and, and the whole book is written in his interior voice. And things happen to him, he can sense things, but he's really, he can barely... Uh, he can't exist on his own. And it just stunned me that uh, Dalton Trumbo carried this off for an entire book. And it taught me the power of the interior voice, that, that self-analysis, that reacting to events around him um, led me to try to do the same thing with Billy Boyle, that he's, he's constantly sensing what's going on around him and what the impact is. The other influence is... Uh, uh, oddly enough, um, Akira Kurosawa, the Japanese filmmaker. And if you watch like uh, his films, like uh, Ran, for instance, which is uh, um, a telling of um, 
King Lear in medieval Japan, he has these magnificent battle scenes that are grand sweeping vistas of thousands of, of extras and dressed in all sorts of colorful garb. Um, and when the battles get intense, he turns the sound off. And all you do is you see the movement of these uh, people attacking each other or, or uh, running away or whatever they're doing. And to me, that was so powerful because the noise just sort of gets in the way. But if you just watch some of his films and get a sense of the power of observation, um, I try to transfer that to the page that as Billy is seeing this, it, as I'm writing it, it's silent. And we're just sensing what's happening around us in sort of a slow motion aspect. Um, now, for the, um, it's, I'm very happy you mentioned that that first chapter in the Devouring because I started doing something different with that book. Um, I, you know, I often do readings, and uh, I was a few years ago was trying to choose a reading, and everyone I liked had too much of a spoiler in it, uh, too much explanation required. And I thought, well, okay, I, I'll write the first chapter of the next book, so it could be the reading. And The Devouring was that, that first time I did that. Uh, and it starts off, and, you know, it's a, lot, a lot of things are going wrong very quickly. And uh, it, it really moved the book in a different the narrative, in a different direction, because previously I had used the first chapter to sort of set the scene, introduce the character, the situation. And I thought, no, for this book, I'm bang. You're just in a lot of trouble real fast. Um, and that seemed to propel the book uh, into action much more quickly and, and smoothly than it had before. And I did the same thing with Solemn Graves, where I wrote the first chapter of that to be the reading. But it turns out I, I have another reading that is, is more descriptive of the, the theme of the book. But that has really changed the way I, I write the books uh, now, oddly enough. Oh, that's really interesting. James, on your website, there's a quote from Oscar Wilde who said, the art of writing is the Thank art... Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. On your website, the quote from Oscar Wilde, the art of writing is the art of applying the seat of one's pants to a chair. After reading some of <laughs> your... Yeah. <laughs> After reading some of your books, I think this may also have something in common with piloting a plane. <laughs> but anyway, can you talk a little about the required balance that's needed between wild creativity and self-discipline in order to produce such engaging stories for your readers? It's amazing what you've produced over the course of a dozen books. Thank you. Um, there is a there's a real connection there, and it, it's kind of odd because they those things sort of seem at odds with each other. But the discipline is writing every day and immersing myself into the story, and that's when the creative part seems to kick in. So if I have an enforced absence or, or something nice, we go on vacation, I don't write for a week or so, I come back and I'm just... I, I'm lost. I, I don't know what's happening with the story. I look at what I've written and think, I, who, who wrote this? This guy's pretty good. I, I can never do this. <laughs> so it, it, it's just having your head in the story as much as possible. That's why even if I can just write one hour a day, I try to do that so the story stays alive in my mind. And I have this kind of woo-woo belief that the characters work in my subconscious I'll also have, often have Billy mention that his dad told him that, you know, let your subconscious work uh, and work out the clues, because his father was a homicide detective who tried to train him. Um, and that, that's one of his techniques. And that reflects how I believe some of the characters work out the process, um, that they're alive in my subconscious. And, you know, I may be staring at the wall, but I'm just letting them do their work. So um, it's linking that discipline of writing every day uh, with the, allowing the creativity to become unleashed in that process, if that makes any sense at all. It, it does. It's great advice. Mm -hmm. I, I really need to buckle down with this self-discipline myself. 
Yeah. Hard. It, it, there's, there's no getting around it. It's hard work. And um, I think many people have an image of, you know, writers having an idyllic existence, but you just really have to work even when you don't want to, when you'd rather be doing something else. It's just like going to a job um, if you want to do it right. Well, can you talk a little about the research you've done for this historical series, especially your interviews with real people who live the history? Among your extensive interviews, is there one that yeah. you might want to share a little detail about with our listeners today? Yes, I, I'll tell you a story. And um, it, it, as I said earlier, you know, I often people will come up with artifacts, with letters that um, the family members have sent, um, all sorts of interesting things. But at, at one um, reading I did early on, um, a woman gave me about a 30 page um, memoir that her uh, father, who served in the war and had long since died, uh, had written about his experience. And as is so common with veterans, he hardly said anything about himself. But his the story in this 30 pages was mostly about a friend of his. And as brief as I can tell it, um, so he was with the 10th Mountain Division in Italy. And his first entry in this memoir was, well, I was on a hospital ship. So he doesn't tell you how we got on a hospital ship. Uh, but the whole story is I saw a friend of mine I hadn't seen for since basic training and he was missing a hand. And I asked him, how did you lose your hand? And his story was that, and this is also the kind of detail that you, you would not get anywhere else. Apparently the army had really pretty sophisticated facilities for uh, getting uh, GIs off the line and giving them showers. They had tractor trailers uh, that were portable shower units. So they would pull up to a village behind the lines. They would pull guys off and have them go through these uh, trailers that were set up with uh, cold showers. And then they would get warmer. And at the end, they would cool down. So that when they went back, they would go right back out onto the line. They, they, they would be uh, in good shape. So it was a very sophisticated setup. And that this guy's uh, unit was pulled off the line in Italy. Uh, and these trucks came to a, a mountainside village. And there was a, a, a monastery on the top of the hill in this village. And if you can envision a, an Italian village that's all, all the buildings are grouped around the, the, the top of the hill. And they're told uh, to put all their clothing in duffel bags and go through the um, shower. And the duffel bags would be given back to them with towels. And they'll go inside the monastery and change back into their clothes. And they're told in no uncertain terms stack all your weapons here, no weapons in the, in the monastery. So the guy puts his, all his boots, everything in the stuffle bag, goes through the shower, given a towel, he and his squad go into the monastery and they go into a, a cell, if you can envision a monk's cell, and it's a stone, um, granite stone building. It has that one narrow window, slotted window that you, you see in monasteries. and. He's pulling his clothing out of the duffel bag and you know, six or seven of his squad mates are in the room with him all changing and something stuck and he's pulling and pulling and he finally pulls something out and he had left a grenade in one pocket and in pulling it out, it pulled the pin. So there's a grenade on the floor, there's six or seven half naked guys in this stone room, there's men in the hallway outside. There's he, so his friend grabs the grenade and he goes to the window and he looks to throw it out this narrow window. But he sees coming up the stone steps in this very narrow passageway, a nun leading a group of children. Oh. So he's got the grenade in his hand, children outside, his buddies inside. He reaches around, if you can envision this, he puts his arm out the window, reaches as far up as he can and grips the grenade until it explodes, oh. takes his hand off. Now that's, that story took up most of that guy's memoir and you never found out what happened to him, but he told the story of his buddy. And that's what has always struck me about all these guys I talked to. They wanna to tell you about their, their buddies who lived, their buddies who died, 
and not so much about themselves. That story made it into a book souvenir that's a, a standalone novel. Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's, that's just beautiful, the sentiment. Going back to your series, in the beginning, Billy Boyle is a young Irish-American cop from Boston who's just made detective mm -hmm. with a little help from his cop relatives and friends. When World War II breaks out, his rabidly anti-English family calls on his mother's distant cousin, Mamie, married to a mm. general, to wangle a staff job for him far from the fighting. Of course, that doesn't exactly work out the way they'd hoped. That's a long distance from the way we now find him in the series. Mm -hmm. what, watching a character grow and develop under intense circumstances and over a dozen books is riveting. What is it that you most like to show in your writing about your character, Billy Boyle? Well, it's, it's really one big story about his growth. And I'd say over the first three books, you know, the first book starts off, he just doesn't want to be there. He, he just wants no part of this thing. Um, and by the end of the third book, where he's, ma he's made a really important decision, he's become committed to this war. And as you mentioned, his family is... Uh, anti-British, they're Irish Republicans, they view this as a war for the British Empire. Um, but uh, through everything he sees, he becomes intensely committed to it. And then the second level of that is now he's paying the psychic cost. He's, you know, he's really meant, even though he works for Eisenhower, he's meant to represent every soldier or sailor or airman who uh, had to have violence visited upon themselves or visited upon others. Um, and he's, he's slowly been paying the cost of that because he's been in all sorts of violent situations, has seen the worst that the war has to offer. And um, in the next book, next year's book, um, that more or less comes to a head. I think it, there's been hints of it in, in the last few books. Um, about the toll it's taking on his on his soul and his mind, um, but that will come to a head soon, and uh, that that's part of the story as well. Is um, you know today we call it moral injury that uh, vets even who, who don't suffer from PTSD or combat fatigue, as they would call it in Billy's day, still suffer a moral injury from doing the things that they're required to do, and that's part of the story I want to tell as well, and have readers view that change in him um, and see what the, the consequences will be. Well, James, we're yeah. delighted that you're going to treat us and our listeners to a reading today. Okay. Um, just to set this up a little bit, part of the story in Solemn Graves is um, about what happened in France uh, during the liberation and before there was any uh, civil authority set up because General de Gaulle and, and the French didn't want the Allies to set up a military government. He wanted to be the leader of France and be the one in charge. And there, were, there was no certainty about who was going to emerge as the leader of the French. Um, so for a period of time, there was no civil authority and the French call that period the wild purge. There were over 10,000 people murdered some of them because they were collaborators and fascists, others because they were somebody just had a grudge. Um, that was the period of time when women had their heads shaved. Um, many of them were simply prostitutes who traded services for money, just like a shopkeeper who was never punished. Um, but that really interested me and, and the, the toll that took on French society. So this reading is a, is a little bit about that. And um, the setup is that uh, Billy and Kaz and Big Mike are driving to a, a recently liberated village to follow up on this murder. Uh, they've been given a driver, Sergeant Fair, whose commanding officer wanted to get him off the line for a while and give him uh, an easy job because he's been in a lot of combat. So here we go. Brickville, Fair announced, pointing to a signpost ahead. 
We left the narrow dirt lane and drove on a paved road into town, low stone buildings on either side of us. Several were in ruins, rubble strewn out into the street. As Fair navigated around the debris, a roar of voices rose from ahead. We drove around a curve, and the road emptied out into the town center, filled with a cheering crowd of a hundred or so. They were gathered around a statue in the center of the cobblestone square, one of the monuments to a bygone war and the local dead to be found in every French town. On the steps of the monument, Legrand stood tall above all others, haranguing the crowd, waving his arms madly, pointing at two men before him, their hands tied and arms held roughly by his men. The crowd surged forward, kicking and striking out at the prisoners. Legrand laughed and his followers did nothing to stop the abuse. It was a festive atmosphere, not for the captives, of course, but everyone else was enjoying themselves, smiling, laughing, clapping one another, one another on the back and congratulating those who struck the hardest blows. These were common folk, hardworking country people, women in their aprons and worn wool stockings, kids in short pants, men in dirty corduroys and slouched berets. Nice people, most likely, except today they were a mob. Ah, Captain Boyle, the Grand called out, holding up his hand to still the crowd. Come, you will see how true Frenchmen deal with collabos. If they collaborated with the Nazis, put them on trial, I said, stepping out of the Jeep. Why, that is what we have done, Legrand said, his one eye lit with fervor. Now for the sentence. He launched into a tirade, pointing at the two men as he addressed the crowd. He says they are profiteurs de guerre, war profiteers, Kaz translated. They ran the black market in this area and paid off the Germans to let them operate. The sentence is death. One of the bound men shouted back at Legrand. The other hung his head, blood dripping from a cut on his cheek. He says Legrand wants his pig farm and knows he has no heirs. He denies working with the Germans and says everyone bought from him, Kaz continued, including many of those who yelled the loudest against him. It won't make any difference, Fair said, holding his M1 in his arms. The shouts and screams of the townspeople proved him right, as did the two resistance men who took up positions behind us. Legrand yelled a command, and the crowd backed away and quickly quieted as the two prisoners were forced to their knees. Legrand's men stepped behind them, pistols at the ready. He nodded. Two shots cracked in the still air, echoing off the stone buildings surrounding us. The men slumped forward, hands bound behind them, dark red blood pooled on the paving stones under lifeless eyes. Another cheer went up from the assembled villagers, not as enthusiastic as the previous shouts had been. This one was to reassure themselves that they were in the right and on the side of justice, no matter how roughly delivered, and to let their neighbors know they were on Legrand's side, because once a mob commits to killing, there's no telling who's next. Jesus, they ain't gonna kill those girls, are they, Big Mike said, pointing to a clutch of young women being pushed through the crowd, four of them, holding on to one another as people spat at them and began tearing at their clothes. By the time they stood before Legrand on the steps of the monument, they were left with nothing but shreds of their dresses covering their undergarments, hands crossed across, crossed over their breasts. Now, Captain Boyle, you shall see how we punish the collaboration horizontal, Legrand said, laughing as his men forced the four women to sit on the steps thought not to receive a bullet. Theirs was to be a less lethal, but still cruel punishment. Men with scissors and hair clippers grabbed them roughly, pulling up their hair. They held them that way for a long minute as the townspeople heaped abuse upon them. At a sharp command from Legrand, they began hacking away. We call this the Coffure 44, Legrand said. You see, we can show mercy, Captain Boyle. Do not judge us too harshly. If we did not do this now, they might be killed later. Here, we'll go back. Next, do not. This is mercy, I asked, watching the girls. One wept while another held her head high, maintaining what dignity she could. Another was noticeably with child, while a younger girl twisted and turned as the clippers were put to work on her auburn hair. But it was the faces of the townspeople, people who knew these young women well, who had likely watched them grow up knew their parents and went to church with them, that stunned me. They were gleeful. They jeered at the girls, taunted them, reaching forward and wagging fingers of righteous disapproval. 
Deep groans of satisfaction arose as the old clippers drew blood. Wild, shrill laughter rang out from hearts and throats unrestrained by pity. The villagers pressed in for their chance to spew humiliation, shame, and degradation. The crowd became a tight knot of flesh closing in around four girls who were perhaps foolish or stupid, or at worst uncaring and unthinking, but not deserving of this. How could they ever live again with these people? How could their tormentors live with themselves? Legrand stepped back, admiring his work. Big Mike and Kaz were staring in frank horror at the scene before us. Only Fair had turned away. Behind us, he watched the streets and exits, scanning rooftops, his rifle at the ready. Of all of us, only Fair remembered there was another enemy out there, an enemy who could strike while other men catered to their worst instincts. He turned in my direction, and I caught a look of strained anguish on his face. And in that moment, it seemed as if he were searching, hopefully, desperately, for his old, well-known foe, men like him, who fought, killed, suffered, and died in the tangled hedgerows and open fields, not those who turned on their own young with leering, superior grins. He kept looking, seeking out what soldiers finally come to know when they've been fighting long enough, that they may have arrived at the point where they have more in common with their enemy than anyone else, including those they had come to liberate or conquer. The intensity, horror, and death of the battlefield has a way of burning away all that is base, tawdry, and disappointing in humanity, like the shorn locks of hair left on the cobblestones in the small village of Brickville. Oh, thank you so much for that, Jim. I just so appreciated that reading, and I, I know our listeners will as well. You're welcome. Uh, talking about, you know, truly it, it's, it's showing, not telling, talking about the whole subject of moral injury and the costs of war, both on the military and civilian populations. That's yeah. just um, really a wonderful way to express that and that period of time. Just so brilliant. Um, I have a question for you. On your website, you quote novelist Rachel Basque as saying, the story has to move down as well as forward. And I'm hoping you can tell us what that means to you and how does doing this as a writer contribute to reader satisfaction? Yes, I, I took a uh, graduate course in uh, novel writing uh, after I'd written the first novel and had not been purchased yet. Um, and uh, Rachel was a, a faculty adjunct faculty at Wesleyan University and a, and a good novelist herself. And she wrote that uh, on, on a work I had turned in and she was uh, critiquing. And I ju it just slammed me because I realized that I, had, I thought I had something with the first book, uh, but that in the second one and the subsequent books, there had to be that consequence for the character, that he could not be that same sh slightly shallow, happy-go-lucky guy, wisecracking, Yankee, you know, stereotype, that, that he that person could not survive the war. Um, and I, I can still see the piece of paper she wrote that on. And it just struck me that I needed to take him on a journey that would not be all that pleasant for him. Uh, and that just uh, encapsulate, encapsulates everything about writing a series, writing a mystery series to me that's important. And what, what I, I dislike in, in some mysteries and some thrillers is when the the protagonist uh, doesn't feel anything about the violence all around them. Even in a cozy, there's a dead body and, and people have, death impacts people. And I, I think that has to be shown and, and works that, that don't show that one way or the other really don't interest me that much. And um, I, to me, there's two kinds of mysteries or thrillers. One in which the character moves through the world and the world is changed. And the other is, the character moves through the world and he or she is changed. And uh, the latter is what interests me much more. Oh, thank you. That's such a great distinction for not only for writers, but also for readers. Mm -hmm. Your two standalone novels include Souvenir, which I really can't wait to read. And I believe those were independently published. Can mm -hmm. you tell us about your journey toward publication and getting an agent? 
Sure, and uh, oddly enough, this goes back to Wendy's mom being uh, uh, in uh, England during World War II. I had um, I, I failed miserably at getting an agent for a long time. I had two books finished, uh, two Billy Boyle books actually, and on a, one standalone. Um, and I had stopped counting after 200 rejections, and I did keep going. And then finally, I thought I, I really need to do some deeper homework and I spent time at the library with the, this was even before a lot of this was on the internet um, researching literary marketplace and the kind of agents who represented books like mine um, and I put together a list of 60 agents that I had not yet queried I have sample chapters from two books I mailed out these 60 packets and um, just waited and this is back in the day when they wanted you to include a self-addressed stamped envelope so they could say no and not have to pay for the postage. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> right? I remember those days. Yes. <laughs> That's so nice. Um, yeah. And uh, so right away, I got a, a, a bunch of them in. Um, thanks, no thanks. Um, and then the, the, the negative comments kept coming in slowly. And it was about four months later. I thought, well, okay, I'm done. I'm not going to put any more time into this. And my wife and I were getting ready to go on a, on a trip to Italy. Uh, we were late. Uh, I was uh, in the shower, and a phone is thrust into the shower. And my wife is saying something to me that I don't understand. And it was an agent who had finally gotten around to uh, reading the manuscripts and like them and taking this back to England. Um, it was a fellow who had just recently retired from uh, being an editor at Publishers Weekly. He was had been born in England, was a child during the Blitz. He was one of those kids who would race around picking up shrapnel from uh, the planes that had, or the, the anti-aircraft fire. Um, and he was one of those, you know, kids wearing shorts, running around wild in the streets in London during the Blitz. And he said, Jim, you got it spot on. And it was only because it, he had a personal connection. He, he saw in that first book the London that he remembered. Um, and then within, then we went to Italy. <laughs> I said, thanks, but I have to go to the airport. Um, and when I got back and signed with them, uh, it was maybe a matter of two months before uh, Soho Press picked up the series. Oh. Oh. So the lesson is don't ever give up, you know. Okay, good. That story makes me feel strangely better, but thank <laughs> you. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Speaking of your website, which is www.jamesrbenben.com, which is a wonderful website, there's a list of recommended books for writers on there, including one called Reading Like a Writer by Francine Prose. Mm -hmm. She talks about something called close reading, and I'm thinking this might be the same thing as deep reading. Can you tell our listeners what close reading is? Right. Close reading is something that both are... are a reader and a writer can do and it's really analyzing the story and getting a sense of what the how the writer is telling the story and that is just a terrific book it's a slim uh, book but it, she does um, uh, chapters on the importance of the first sentence or, or the the first paragraph and it's just it's getting down into the trenches so to speak of writing uh, and and what's important and she also talks about, you know, how, how, to, how to read closely to um, get a, a deeper level of understanding about what the writer is doing. You know, sometimes I'll often read mysteries and try to figure them out. And oftentimes I just want to enjoy myself and not not read at that level. And other times I, I'll take it down a little more deeply and uh, and try to uh, understand how the writer is constructing the story. But it's a terrific book. Good. I'm going to definitely look for that one. That was one I was not familiar with, and I sort of thought at this point I read them all, but thank you for that recommendation. I know that you're slated to attend um, the New England Crime Bake in this November, mm -hmm. and it's something I'm considering attending in 2019. For many of us from the West Coast, what's that event all about? I somehow keep picturing lobsters and chowder and murder weapons. Well, we all go down to the beach and have a clam bake and talk in Maine accents and have clam chowder. <laughs> no, it's, a, 
it's a uh, it's a really great conference. It's small scale, but it's really built. It's for fans, but also for aspiring writers. And um, they always have great panels. Um, they bring in a lot of people. It's a lot of how to stuff. Um, so if if somebody is, is a fan and there's authors there they like, they can have a great time. But it's really focused on providing resources to aspiring writers. Um, they have a short story competition. Um, and, and it's small scale enough that you just hang out and you can you can talk with just about everybody there. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And I might have to check that it's out. It's sort of a, um, an analog to um, Sleuthfest in Florida. So Florida uh, Mystery Rise of America puts on a similar level conference, a little larger, but it's it's accessible. Sleuthfest in Florida, especially if it's in the winter, so if you want to go to Florida in the winter. Right. Um, right. Or you can come to Massachusetts in November. <laughs> okay, and freeze. Yes. <laughs> well, hopefully not. Um, James, you're known for unearthing fascinating pieces of relatively unknown World War II history and then constructing highly suspenseful mysteries around those facts. Uh, my question also is about research. How do you know how much detail to share with readers? Well, it's... um. <laughs> That's a, that's a good question, because you need more information than you're, you're going to use. And I, I call it a total immersion, that if I'm writing, for instance, this book that's set in Normandy, I'll read everything I can about Normandy, even if it has nothing to do with the war. It might be the history of France in that area, or um, farming in Normandy, or gardens of Normandy. I just want to become so soaked in uh, the feel of Normandy, that it becomes natural to write about it. And uh, I just came across this uh, bit from um, uh, Ernest Hemingway, because he's going to be in the next book. So I was reading up about Hemingway. And he called it the iceberg theory. And it's sort of similar. And he said the majesty of an iceberg is due to the fact that uh, nine tenths of it is underwater and uh, the power of majesty of an iceberg. And that's how you should use information uh, in historical settings, is you only are gonna use about 10% of it. <clears throat> but the, the knowledge that you have will give you the self-confidence to write coherently about it. And I think that's pretty true, that if you don't know a lot, you can make mistakes and you can be unsure. But if you know a lot about um, a particular setting or time, uh, you'll write with confidence and that will show through. So you really want to leave a lot out and, and you want to know a lot that isn't even necessary to the story. I just like to, when I have the feel like if a time machine dropped me somewhere in a period of time, I would at least know how to act, you know, and how to walk down the street and, and not be dumbfounded by what I saw. So that's my little imaginary um, uh, trick is to, once I feel comfortable that the time machine would take me there, uh, I can start writing. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And I'm going to jump into my segment now, and I've titled it, It's a Battle. It mm. seems appropriate to be talking about conflict and war after reading some of James Ben's insightful books set during what many still call the big war, World War II. There's a provocative nonfiction book, one I finally read from my must read stack of books called Tribe by Sebastian Younger, who also wrote The Perfect Storm. He says it's about, and I'm quoting from his introduction here, what we can learn from tribal societies about loyalty and belonging and the eternal human quest for meaning. As an embedded journalist who was in Sarajevo and Afghanistan, he also studied a different type of tribe, the U.S. military, and looked at what happens to its members when the tribe is disbanded and veterans are sent home. In a year where we seem increasingly divided and suspicious of each other, I think that's why many of us read to experience that sense of belonging even vicariously. I know also that that's why I write and specifically why I'm writing about my grandfather's experiences during World War I, what was called the war to end all wars. And during my research, I found so many echoes some of them disturbing echoes of our times in things I've discovered in the past. There's a push 
pull, a battle of sorts, for anyone who writes historical fiction or memoir. What novelist Kazuo Ishiguro once said was the struggle between forgetting and remembering. It's a kind of struggle that can produce some great stories. At least, I hope so. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Julie. Today I want to talk about sharing the joy of reading. No place knows better how to share the joy of reading than our incredible libraries and the knowledgeable and helpful people who work there. All the drastic predictions that ebooks would be the end of our libraries were completely wrong. In fact, quite the contrary. Today's libraries are resources for every type of media that you can imagine that tells a story. Thank you so much to the giving people who work there and to the taxpayers who recognize the value returned on the dollars they invest. As First Lady, Lady Bird Johnson once said, Perhaps no place in any community is so totally democratic as the town library. The only entrance requirement is interest. Next month, as in every October, look for these exciting themed events at your local library. Teen Read Week is celebrated the same week as Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day every year. A national literacy initiative of the Young Adult Library Services Association, it's aimed at teens, their parents, librarians, educators, booksellers, and other concerned adults. Teen Read Week was started in 1998. The continuing message of this week, at the initiative, is to encourage 12 to 18 year olds to read for the fun of it. Friends of library groups have their very own National Week of Celebration, promoting the group in the community, raising awareness and increasing membership, and also giving libraries and boards of trustees the opportunity to recognize the friends for their help and support throughout the year. And American Library Association's National Gaming Day, first celebrated in 2008, focuses on the social and recreational side of gaming. Gaming at the library encourages all ages to interact, share their expertise, and develop new strategies for gaming and learning. At the library, kids can socialize with their friends and play board and video games while surrounded by books, librarians, and a real world of knowledge. I hope you take the time to celebrate your library in October and every month. To paraphrase famous journalist Norman Cousins, a library should be the delivery room for the birth of ideas and a place where history comes to life. And as my recommendation for today's episode, I recommend you try Library Lovers Mysteries by Jen McKinley. In tribute to our guest's past life as a librarian, this fun, cozy mystery series immediately came to mind. The latest in the series, the ninth book, is titled Hitting the Books, and it was chosen as one of the top 10 books of September by Library Reads. You can dive right in with this latest book, or I recommend enjoying the series from the beginning. When a stack of library materials is found at the scene of a hit and run, library director Lindsay Norris finds herself dragged into the investigation as the police try to link the driver of the stolen car to the person who borrowed the books. Before Lindsay can delve into the library's records, the victim of the hit and run, Teresa Houston, suffers another accident, and the investigation shifts from driver negligence to attempted homicide. A clue surfaces in the confiscated library materials that could crack open the case, and it's up to Lindsay to piece it all together, but things are not as they seem in the sleepy town of Briar Creek, And when the driver of the stolen car turns up dead, Lindsay, her staff, and her library friends have to hit the books to catch the murderer. Amidst this turmoil, library director Lindsay Norris is also dealing with personal upheaval. She's recently moved in with her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Captain Mike Sullivan, known as Sully. While they are deliriously happy together, there are definitely annoying cohabiting issues to be resolved. Talented author Jen McKinley has written several series, both mysteries and romances. Three of her series have landed on the New York Times bestsellers list. 
She went to Southern Connecticut State University studying English literature and library science. She took a full-time job working as a librarian in Cromwell, Connecticut for some time before moving to Arizona where she still lives now with her family, avidly writing her entertaining series. In a recent interview, Jen said, when I first started writing The Library Lover's Mysteries, I was sure that the series would only be a trilogy. There aren't enough words to express how delighted I am to have been so very wrong. Hitting the Books is the ninth book in The Library Lover's Mysteries, and I'm thrilled that there will be another one coming out next year. The interesting thing about having a series continue for many books is that the story arcs and character arcs have the opportunity to grow in ways that even the author cannot anticipate. Now, James, I'm wondering, what would you like to recommend for our listeners in addition to what's on your website? Do you have a recommendation for us today? Sure. And uh, first, I would say I have to check out the Library of Mysteries because I, I went to Southern Connecticut State University for my Library of Science degree as well. So I'll have to see what Jen is up to. Right. Um, the book I want to recommend is um, goes a little farther back. And I just finished recently reading uh, the new translation of The Odyssey uh, by Emily Wilson. And, you know, like many people, I was forced to read The Odyssey during my education and thought it was pretty dull and you know remember a lot of the Saturday morning movies with those animatronic monsters that, that told the story as well but Emily Wilson has written uh, a translation that is so true to our time and Homer's time that it's it's uh, it's a phenomenal work of, of art um, it's an incredible story and I got the book because it sounded interesting. The reviews were great. And I thought, well, I'll read a few pages a night. Well, I would be up till midnight reading because it is it is a page turner. Um, and I, as well as it being so well done, she provides a new look at the story uh, through uh, feminist eyes because she's the first woman to have translated it. And it even touches on some of the troubling themes we have today in terms of, of how women are treated um, in looking at how male translators have translated the story. But most importantly, you know, storytelling is in our genes and uh, going back to a 3000 year old story uh, that's still relevant today, I think is an important way to connect with that storytelling tradition that has gone on uh, ever since, uh, even from the time that people were living in caves. Um, one of the most awesome things I ever read about uh, uh, cave dwellers is you've seen pictures of the chambers where they have paintings of the bison and the hunt and you know people's hands with the ochre uh, marked around them. Uh, yes. They, they've never known before why certain chambers were chosen to have those paintings because they weren't in every chamber in a cave complex. They brought in acoustic engineers to test out the sound quality, and they found that all, all throughout the world, wherever they find these, the chamber that they're in has the best acoustics. And what that tells me is they were in there telling stories, that they were telling the story of the hunt or whatever, whatever the drawings were about, and they were telling stories to large groups of people. And so many thousands of years ago, we were gathering together to tell stories. And we're still doing that with books today. And I think it's just important to recognize that and to learn from it. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm going to talk today about The Great American Read. PBS has a wonderful program called The Great American Read, hosted by Meredith Vieira. 
where readers learn more about those great books you really should have read in high school. But you know what? It's not too late. You can vote for your favorite American novel. It's an eight-part series taking the top 100 books and breaking them into compelling episodes featuring author interviews, their personal picks for America's top books, and background on how these books were written. One episode is all about misfits, those who don't belong, and includes Catcher in the Rye and To Kill a Mockingbird. Another show in the series will focus on love in its many forms, and one is all about banned books. There's also one on first novels that made it big, which includes Gone with the Wind, The Joy Luck Club, The Outsiders, and The Martian. There's a segment on mystery fiction, so I'm looking forward to going through the finalist lists. And yes, Wendy, there is an Agatha Christie novel on that list. The website, <laughs> yes. Yes, the website for the series is www.pbs.org forward slash the great American read, that's all hyphenated, forward slash books forward slash. And you can print off a list of the top 100 books and also sort the list by genre and age reading level. So remember, vote for your favorite as many times as you wish until October 23rd, when America's best loved book will be chosen. In closing, our sincere gratitude to James Ben for joining us for a talk today and telling us all about the adventures of Lieutenant Billy Boyle. Keep reading and keep writing. And don't forget to subscribe to Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries so you never miss an episode. Thanks again. Thank you.